Okay, no? Okay, first question. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and your background, and are you self-taught, or have you taken some training? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, I'm Woody Woodman. Uh, I'm an, an artist, and uh, I've worked in the animation industry for about 20 years. Uh, before I was in, in animation, I was uh, a Marine. So that's interesting as a, as a, um, as a, my, my history coming from being a soldier in the Marine Corps and then going into animation. A lot of people ask me, how, did, how does that happen? But the truth is, I was always an artist. I was always somebody who, who doodled. I liked to draw a lot when I was in school. I daydreamed a lot. I used to enjoy um, going outside and playing with my imagination, just making things up. So I was always a very creative person and I didn't know what to do with it. So when I was in high school, I didn't have a lot of people telling me that I could go into something like animation or I could be a comic book artist. I liked comic books, I liked watching animation, but I never really had someone to really inspire me or to tell me, you should do this. So I joined the Marine Corps because it allowed me to leave the small town that I was growing up in. I didn't get to see a lot when I was growing up. So this was going to be an opportunity to go see a lot more of the world, to travel and meet a lot of different people in a lot of different places. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I decided it was better to be an artist and not get shot at. <laughs> it was a better way to make a living than being shot at. So that's when I went to art school. So you were asking me if I was, if I was um, self-taught. Self As an artist, you always will teach yourself. In the early days, I never had formal training. I was a kid. I just liked to look at comic books. I would look and I would draw and I would use my imagination and then I would draw. A lot of the things that I was playing when I was out playing with my friends and then I would come back and I would draw. Okay? My grandmother used to, on a rainy day, and you couldn't be outside to play, you'd be inside and she would just give us, all of us kids, paper and pencils and crayons and then we would draw these, these things in our head. So that's when you start learning to draw and think of the world visually you know, using your imagination and putting these things on paper. So, yes, as a kid, you're self-taught. I was self-taught. I drew all the time I was drawing. Then later, after the Marine Corps, I did go to art school, you know. That's when I spent the time to learn the art history, um, history of illustration, and I learned um, this process of illustration, how to work things from a very rough state, and then do a tonal study, do a color study, and then to go to the final, um, the final production. That's when I was trained as an illustrator. I did learn and did a lot of figure drawing and figure painting and sculpture. I did the traditional training that was needed just to produce an artist, okay, just to learn about design. And this is something that I, 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 I did learn in art school, so that was very necessary. I think, was that the whole question? Yep. A little bit about me and my, um, my training. All right, the next, as a professional storyteller and illustrator, which area you enjoy the most and why? Okay, so that's a good question, because I didn't know really, other than watching animation, I didn't really know a lot about the process of animation. I wasn't that interested in animation. I wasn't influenced by illustration, and I know you have a question about that, so I won't go into detail, but I was more interested in illustration. I was more interested in, in, in that visual medium, that graphic medium of putting an image and telling a story in one panel. Or in a series of panels, like in a children's book, I was very interested in learning to be an illustrator for a newspaper, or to work for Hallmark, or something like that. Uh, later, I was I was recruited out of art school because my figure drawing was so well. I drew well. I had a background in caricature. I drew very quickly. I would go to parties, and I um, I basically paid for my way through college when I was in school by going to parties and doing caricatures at events like weddings and, and these kind of birthday parties and carnivals, I would go and do caricatures. So in my drawing, you'd see a lot of caricature and cartooning in my illustration. I enjoyed that. When I went to Disney, I had to be retrained. I was retaught this process of animation. I didn't, know, I didn't understand it before, but what I was most interested in was really the, the drawing the panels and telling the story in a sequence. I was not that interested in animation. For me, it was just too tedious <laughs> to sit there. I did it for three years. I, when I first go to, came to Disney, they had a training program. They taught us the foundations of animation, the principles of animation. 
I had to be retrained in the in this process of, of animating and, and learning things about timing, about spacing, squash and stretch. These were these were all principles that I was not taught in art school. However, I did learn that I did not want to sit there and, and draw every frame right after the other in, in like an animator would do. I was interested in storyboards. So for me, one of my big influences coming to Disney was Chris Sanders and Dean Dubois. When I came on to Disney, we were doing the movie Mulan. And I saw all the storyboard panels were pinned up on the walls. And I spent my evenings with my sketchbook and I copied every panel one by one. I would copy. And that's how I learned. So when you talk about education, you can go to art school. Okay? You can be taught by people. They'll sit down and they'll teach you these skills. But I learned early on in the Marine Corps, if you want to learn something, you must learn. You must teach yourself. So I did that all through art school I, as well I did it in Disney. I had to teach myself and I learned by watching and copying these really master storytellers. That's what I was interested in. I wanted to get in the story department and it took three years mm -hmm. at Disney to, to work and, and, and you have to be very aggressive and you have to knock on the doors and you talk to the directors and you'd say, hey, can you take a look at my work? Can you see? And you, you, have, to, you have to be very uh, aggressive that way. And then there was a training program at Disney when you get accepted into the story department they had a training program uh, that I did six months uh, working on Treasure Planet so I was working on production but they had uh, classes and, and I got to uh, you know I was I was trained under very experienced you know animators like Glenn King and, and um, uh, Frank and uh, these guys would you know sort of mentor me you know this is the it was the method they did at Disney they mentored uh, you and, 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 and trained you up and that's what I did and I've been doing that for 20 years okay I've been I've been in the story board department working on feature films and television okay what's your next question uh, can you describe your typical workflow when you're working on a project where whether it is personal or for a client okay that's a good question um, now you just have to understand what I do as a storyboard artist I'm current currently usually working with either the director, if I'm not the director, then I'm working for uh, a director, or possibly writers. And on TV, the writers have a much more important role in terms of the production, so I work with the directors, but I'll also be talking to the writers. And my job as a story artist is to take either the written form, if it's a script, or taking, sometimes they'll just pitch me the story. The director will simply say, this is what the story is. And he would tell me the story, tell me the emotional high points and low points. And then my job is to visualize it. So that's why my, my background as an illustrator is much more uh, important. We will work out the panels and the characters have to be keyframed, much like animation. So my background also has to understand that discipline of animation. Working in animation, understanding how to how to work a, a strong pose with a strong silhouette. A story artist has to work quickly and they have to be seen very easily because there is a process that has been developed by Disney where we'll take uh, the storyboard sketches and we actually scan these images, we build what's called an animatic. And this animatic will be, the, the drawings will go by much like animation with just these key poses and you'll get a sense of the cutting and the editing, it'll be timed the voice uh, actors that put their voices in there. And there is a process of producing an animatic that has taken many years to develop, but at Disney they perfected it. And now in the digital age, all of all of these films are done with this storyboard process and editing. Now, when I'm working, you were talking about my workflow, mm -hmm. I found a very, for me, a very efficient way of, of working, which is very similar to the way an illustrator would work. I will first take the writing or take the story and I still will write. I will write out my basic story points. What does the character want? Where is the character trying to go? What is in the character's way? I have a you know, sort of a formula that I've learned over the years of, of how to address the scene. Then I will work what's called the thumbnail process. The thumbnail process is how you stage the scene. Where do you place the camera? Where do you place the characters in the set? And being able to see that set, and I usually will do, I will draw out a drawing that will basically be a, a down shot, and I, I can see exactly where all my characters are and where the cameras are. Then I work out what's called blocking. This is the composition. 
This is what the camera will see. So these key frames will be very important. I will then present this to the director. I will sometimes if the director is here, I will simply sit down with with just a few pages of drawings, and they can see the layout. They can see what the variety of shots, wide shots, middle shots, close-up shots, reaction shots, over-the-shoulder shots. They can see all the shots I'm thinking about using. Very visual, very quick. Then they can also make suggestions. Well, what if we put the camera here or there? What if we move this from here to there? I don't want this on the, uh, on the river or on the water because it'll be too difficult to animate the characters you know, walking through water. Can we start the scene where they're coming off the boat? So this is a discussion that I'll have with a director, and I haven't done hundreds and hundreds of drawings. I simply have outlined it in thumbnails. And I know a lot of um, uh, people new to the business or people that don't, uh, haven't worked out a very efficient way of working, and what they'll do is they simply start with one piece of paper, and they start treating the storyboard process like an animator. One page straightforward, they call it straightforward animation. The problem is, I've worked with a lot of board artists, I've been directing and I've worked with other board artists that work this way and they will sometimes do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drawings and then I'll sit there and look at all these drawings and I'll say, well listen, this makes no sense. Why is the character doing this? He should be doing that later. And there's an editing process that happens between, between the director or the writer and the storyboard artist. And I've tried to find a way that make that very simple. Do fewer drawings, but very simple drawings that clearly outline the scene. That's the storyboard process that I, I work on. This is the storyboard process that I, that I teach as well. Um, then I will do a rough pass, and we're, nowadays we're doing things digitally. So I, I, I can sometimes I'll thumbnail things out on paper, traditionally like I'm very comfortable working with a pen and paper. Now we use programs like Toon Boom, which is one of the programs that I enjoy because it's just quick. It's already in a timeline. You work on a Cintiq, and you're still drawing, you know, but, but it's the frame by frame, and you draw a background, and when you, do, when you duplicate to the, next, to the next frame, the background comes with it. All the assets come with it, and it's very quickly, and I keep it very rough. You'd have to look at examples, and you'd see how rough. I keep it very, very rough. And then once that pass gets approved by the director, then you'd go into more of a cleanup pass. This is where you're going to have a fine line. You might put tone and so forth. But again, this is the backbone of the sequence. So this is something that is very important. And I, I use those three steps from, from thumbnail process to the rough pass to the, to the cleanup pass. And most people in most productions are very accustomed to that. They're used to that process. Oh, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so next, in your opinion, how is the co cooperation between storytellers and illustrators should okay. look like? Yeah, this is, a, this is an unusual question. I was asking about it earlier. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between maybe illustration process or illustrating for a magazine or a graphic novel versus animation? And there, there are two different disciplines, okay? But the foundation is the same. The process, like I just mentioned, is the same. Taking an idea or taking a story, whether it's for a children's book or a comic book, you have some kind of written story or you have a story that someone has told you. How do you illustrate it? How do you visualize it? So in, in, um, in a book form, like if you have a, a children's book, obviously this is a different experience, how the viewer will look at it from page to page. They'll, look at, they'll read the text, they'll look at the image, and then they turn the page. So in that way, it is sequential, it is storytelling, and you are using all the things you learn about design and drawing and illustration is there. For animation, it's a much bigger production. Okay? As an illustrator, you might have one illustrator doing a book. You have one author, maybe, and then you have the publisher that, that produces the book. In animation, you're going to have hundreds, if not thousands of people working on a production. So the pipeline, how it's produced from the writers, from the directors, to not just one story artist, usually you'll have a team of story artists, and then it goes into the background department, the layout department, the animation department. They have many, many departments. And then in those departments, like in animation, you'll have your lead animator, and then you'll have all of your assistants, and your breakdown, and your in-betweeners, and so on. This is a very large production, so 
the skills that are required, the basic foundational drawing and design as an artist, that is common. Storytelling is an art when you're dealing with, with sequential images, whether it, it be a graphic novel, children's book, or animation. The process is different. How it's produced, the amount of people, time, and money is what's different. Okay, But the basic skill sets, the basic requirements for us, if you were a student you want to work as an illustrator, then you're, you're probably going to be working alone. You'll be comfortable working alone. You'll have an art director or you'll have your client, but it's a much intimate experience. Animation, you must work as a team. Unless you're a concept artist, you'll still work for the art director, you'll still work for the director, um, but if you're working in the production, on the production, you're going to be a small part of a much, much bigger production, okay, pipeline. Okay, so there are two different experiences, but the skill sets of drawing or design are the same in both, okay. I won't talk about the, the, the art of storytelling, is, is really a separate subject altogether, how a story starts and then how you do build uh, the middle of the story to a climactic point and then it ends. That's story structure. That's probably more complicated to explain in this short interview. Okay, but actually for, for illustration and storyboarding there are very similar similar skill sets that I've used in, in either, okay, in either <coughs> illustration or animation. Okay, what else do you have? What are your major influences? Any artists in particular who influence you all, or other media such as Music and movies? Sure, okay. Um, I, I probably don't have a lot of um, musical um, influences. I don't, uh, I don't listen to a particular type of music to get me in a particular mood. I like country western music, so sometimes I'll put that on. <laughs> Just because it, you know, it's, it's something that I feel comfortable with. But it's not, I, I'm not a particular, I'm not like a fine artist who, who needs to listen to a certain kind of music to, to, to make a certain kind of mark. I'm not doing that kind of work, you know. Um, but as far as uh, artists uh, over the years, then yes, I have many influences. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, I was into comic books. One of my first big influences in, 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 in illustration would be Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta was a fantasy concept artist. He did, obviously, he did um, from the, uh, the 40s, he was doing uh, comic strips, and then he would do um, graphic novels and in print. For, for magazines. When he was later, when he left Al Cap and he went into um, uh, his own uh, uh, illustration book cover for fantasy like Conan and, and Tarzan, these kind of fa fantasy uh, book covers, that's what he's well known for. When I was a kid in the 19, early 70s, they, he produced these books that all of a sudden I, I could see these amazing fantasy things like Conan and, and Tarzan that I enjoyed. And that was one of the guys I said, well, I'd like to, I'd like to <laughs> I want to learn to draw like that because I was a fan in the Marvel comics. I enjoyed Conan comics. So looking at, at these artists in, in, in those comic books was, again, a way to escape. That was something I, I, I enjoyed doing by, by using my imagination and drawing. I could be somewhere else. I could do something else, which is why later when I finished high school, I wanted to go do something else. <laughs> I didn't want to be in my the same little town that I grew up in, I wanted to go see some of these things and have these adventures. So Frank Fazetta was a very uh, important influence for me. Uh, artists like Norman Rockwell, again, he, he had a way of, of illustrating and telling that story in one painting. He could tell so much story and have so much caricature and personality. That was, was very important to me. Um, later there was um, artists like um, Heydrich Clay, I would draw when I did my, my, my drawing, a figure drawing, uh, my pen was very loose and it just kind of was fluid all over the page. And some of the older artists that I used to, I used to uh, attend some figure drawing co courses outside of the college, and I met a lot of local artists that were also, they were comic book artists from the 50s. And they said, well, you look like Heinrich Clay, the way you're using that pen. I didn't know who he was, you know. But then, of course, I looked it up. You know, I, I found Heinrich Clay and I looked at his, he did the caricature uh, satires for newspapers in World War I, he was put in prison because of his caricatures. They were so powerful. Um, then later in World War II, he was put in prison again because he was making funny pictures of, of Adolf Hitler. Anyway, later when I went to Disney, um, obviously you saw movies like Fantasia. They had these dancing hippos and alligators. 
and a good, all of that influence was from Heinrich Clay. You know, Walt Disney was a big fan of him, and and, and there was so much um, magic in in, in 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 animation in in his drawing. It was there, so that was something that was very important for me to kind of capture motion and expression and caricature. So these were very important influences um, when I first uh, was in illustration and going and looking at animation. Also, a lot of the um, Peter Desev, H. B. Lewis. Carter Goodrich, these were characters, or people that I actually, some of my, I, I was very aware of at Disney because these guys are used on every animated feature. When I went to Ardman, they were still using Peter DeSev. So uh, every DreamWorks and, and Blue Sky, Blue Sky actually moved Peter DeSev into and gave him an office. They're very, very well respected um, illustrators and caricaturists. And so when you see a lot of these magazines in print, I was drawn towards that kind of caricature. So that's why I was, I was, influenced and did a lot of caricature you know in college because I was trying to emulate or, or try to learn from these these guys um, okay that's okay for now <laughs> okay. Uh, what other interests do you have that helps influence your works and keep you motivated um, well I, I, I'm now I'm, I'm married I have two children so obviously um, being married there's a lot of responsibilities so you know you you have to get work. <laughs> so this industry, luckily animation, and luckily I was I was fortunate working in storyboarding that when when two D animation at Disney uh, ceased and it basically stopped all over, not all over the world, but Japan still uh, obviously they love their anime and, and they have a long tradition of um, of comic book art and so forth. So that did, that didn't change much, but the rest of the world pretty much put 2D animation away, and that affected a lot of people in this industry. Luckily for me, storyboarding uh, would be done no matter what the process was. It was stop motion, didn't matter. If it was 2D, didn't matter. It was 3D, didn't matter. So a lot of productions I've gone on to, obviously they're CGI productions, and uh, it didn't affect my ability to do storyboards. So I was able to keep working. A lot of people had to leave this industry entirely. I was fortunate to keep working and working from one project to the other. I just had to travel. <laughs> I thought when Disney left Orlando, my family, my home was in Orlando. So, in terms of inspiration, one of the big motivators is that yes, I enjoy working on production. I enjoy animation, but I had to um, obviously provide for my family, and they always stayed at home. So that was that was a, that was something I had to sacrifice is not being home. So, so my children and my wife, of course, uh, are constantly something that I have to work hard <laughs> to to provide for. Um, as far as creatively, the, that's another story. Obviously, um, what I do get a chance to do to work on my own things, I think you're, you're, you will ask me a question about some of the things I do for myself. If I always have a, a pet project, I always have something going on, whether it's a children's book or whether it's a possible feature. If I ever got a chance to direct again, I have had a few opportunities to do that. I left Disney to work on my own film called Tugger the Little Jeep uh, that wanted to fly. A very small production. It did get made. It, 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 the production value was very low, but this was, a, 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 you know, obviously something I was very passionate to. I wanted to direct, and this was my character. I got to write it, story tell, you know, I storyboarded the whole film and directed it. Um, recently, um, I, you know, I, I've been able to do. This is the. Can I show this now? I guess okay. this was the book that I did because you were asking. You're going to ask me mm. about what I wanted to do. Right? So when I when I do get a chance to take to take something like uh, one of my original stories. Billy Pippin his magical trip. Obviously, I got to create the story. I got to, to create the characters, and I did it as a children's book, you know, so I could could at least put it in some form. But obviously, I would I I've been able to pitch this to studios. I would love for a studio to 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 want to take that into animation. So yes, I have that. I do have that. Um, you know, in, what do you call it? Um, aspiration, <laughs> an aspiration to do something like more children's books and more uh, possible animations. Um, but that's that's one of the things I'm interested in. Okay. The other thing I don't know did I answer your question. Uh, the the what would you what would be your dream project thing? Yeah, this one. Well, do, already answered. This would be the idea. dream. I mean, this okay. is one because it's it's so well developed. You know, we already wrote this. I, I partnered with a friend of mine. Oh. Um, yeah, Richard Guillemot over here. He was, <laughs> he was a 26 year, uh, at least 26 years uh, at sea captain, and so the story was Ooh. about a little boy who gets lost at sea, and this crazy captain finds him, uh, and, and the boy wants to go home, and they make a deal. The captain says, "Well, I'll, I'll be glad to take you home if you help me catch this sea dragon." And so they agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he asks him, "How long? How long have you been chasing this dragon?" And he said, "Well." 
45 years. And it's like, oh, this is going to be a long journey. So they, they, you know, he, he basically will go and search for this mythical sea serpent with this crazy sea captain. So I had the opportunity to work with, with Richard, right? He had all of his experience at sea, take that and put it into a written form. And then, of course, I illustrated it mm. as a book. Later, this would be amazing if we could take this into animation. If there was a studio that would be willing to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> millions of dollars, it's much, much more difficult than you, you think. Yeah. So, about, are you at Source Animation Studio? With all the facilities and opportunities that are here, what do you see for the next five or ten, ten years from now? So, this question, I was, I was a little confused what you were asking me because there's two things. You have the school here in Crudis, R-U-S, right? And, and, and they're obviously um, very interested in, in getting into this animation industry, but there is a lack of talent. There's a lack of experience that can come here to teach. So when uh, Mr. Pramati asked me, he, I was working as uh, directing in Singapore, and he met me, and he brought me here. So I, I was probably a good, a good candidate. I was a good find because I had a lot of animation experience, but I also had a lot of teaching experience because over the years working with a lot of really great storytellers and working on a lot of great productions I've been able to continue my skills as not only an artist but as a teacher I learned from a lot of great teachers and then over the years when I was at a different uh, country or with a different studio I would take it upon myself to, to teach I would you know once a week or something I would go to one of the universities and I would offer to teach a course this is something that I wanted to do you know, as an artist, but also uh, developing my own ability to, to train someone, like in figure drawing. The interviewer here, right, uh, Amira was one of my students mm -hmm. at LaSalle. And so she met me there, and I was training students at LaSalle and DigiPen in Singapore. When I met Pramati, he brought me here to uh, the school in Crudis, R-U-S, and, and, and we began doing workshops. And this was something that he wanted, obviously he needed to bring that kind of talent to someone like me there to, to train not only the students, but to train the faculty. Train the faculty up to a standard where they were then able to produce a student that could work in the industry. So that's, as I say, it's, it's a difficult question because this university, this school, has its own goal and where they want to be in five years. I'm hopefully helping them. Um, so something where I want to be in five, five years, if I don't get the opportunity to, to direct another picture, I'm getting older, so um, this becomes more difficult, is teaching. Mm -hmm. So obviously my role here at this school um, and in my career now is obviously developing uh, ways to develop and train for this school or any school, right? My ability to teach. So this is what I brought this since we're doing a plug, but this is this is the book. Hopefully we'll print here mm -hmm. and we'll have it available here at this school. And this covers just drawing people, right? But foundational drawing is something so crucial. We understood it at Disney because Disney could recruit the best. They went to all the schools around the world and they could recruit the best talent and it, they produced the best quality of work. So this was very important. How do you train the students in that foundational drawing and design? This is something that I'm interested in. You know, when you were asking me, where do I want to be in five years? I obviously want to continue to pursue my ability to teach, to make these kind of, these kind of books, these kind of programs, like we're doing here at RUS, okay? Uh, then what suggestions do you have for us in the future? us as in students or just the school? The school. So for the school, I think things are going very smoothly. Um, even though we had the first semester we had was rough, but we were developing a, um, it's an online system where I was able to pre-record and demonstrate each assignment uh, it, accompanied with um, what was called a PDF which is basically what, what you see in these books. It's basically my notes and examples uh, and, and how to teach drawing and how to teach design from basic objects to more complicated objects to human anatomy and animal anatomy. And then later going into storyboarding, you know, how to take, that, how to take a student and give them a basic foundation of these kind of basic drawing that I learned you know, in, in, in art school and later at Disney and taking that knowledge of my understanding of production and bring it to the school. So that's a good step. I mean, that's, that's one way that they're doing to bring some, you know, a talent like myself into the classroom. Then these uh, workshops they do twice a year to come here, this is great because again, 
we're making a connection, we're trying to bring some of that knowledge into this school, which normally would not have that opportunity. These students here would not normally have that opportunity. So that's great. So I think, I think as far as moving forward, you must have the foundation in drawing. You asked me about my beginning. I started with drawing, and I enjoyed drawing. This is how I learned about observation from life. You know, at Disney that was very important. We had to watch people because we're, ta we're making stories about people. It didn't matter if it was if the character was a bear or a bunny or a bird. They were people. And we're telling stories to people about people. So relationships, mother, fa father, daughter, um, husband and wife, children, siblings. These kind of interactions are what happen in real life. So as an artist, that's where you start. You go out there and you have to learn your basic foundations of drawing and drawing from observation. Looking and seeing and putting it down in paper. And that's when you learn design. That's when you start applying these, the design principles and the elements of design that we talk about in, in, a, in a foundation or an art school. You then start applying it to your animation, whatever discipline. It doesn't matter if it's storyboarding or if it's animation or if you're going to be a background artist. If you're going to be designing sets, those sets are functional. Those sets, the design of the sets, what's in the set are based on observation. One of the problems that I see at, with, at, at, at smaller studios that I go to and I, and I try to mentor or try to educate people that are building props, people that are laying out the set in CGI, the set looks sterile. It has no history. When you look at the set, you're like, well, yes, there's a table, there's a chair. It doesn't sit. It doesn't feel organic. It doesn't feel like my house. When I go to my house, I have magazines and I have kids' toys and I have, you know, the dog running around and, and he, the dog is chewed on. He's chewed on the corner of the table. He's torn this. The baby spilled something there. The house has a history. So at Disney, we, we knew nothing could be straight. There was no such thing as a straight line. Things had to, be, had to have a wornness to it. The props and the sets as you build the set had to have a sense of history. This comes from sketching on location. You go places and you look and you study and you watch and you record what you're seeing. So that's something that I think in terms of any school or any artist when they're developing, they must develop that habit of observation. If you're going to be an animator, if you're going to be a storyteller, you have to develop those skills. Drawing skills is how you develop your sense of design to understand shape, volume, tone, and so forth. So that's something I would say for any university, especially this one, because this, this the history in this town, in this university, is not one of drawing. It doesn't come from a long history of drawing. So it's hard for someone like me to tell some, a young student who's used to watching CGI animation films why they need to draw. You know, that's very difficult. I have this trouble every, every university I go. And I'll tell them, you're just going to have to trust me. If you're simply looking at CGI films from the that the, 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 the software or the Maya program that you're using is going to help you in any way bring a character to life, you are missing. And they are. When I was directing in, in, in Singapore on the TV show, that's, I, every, problem was, every problem was there. They weren't acting. They weren't actually getting up and physically moving and doing the action of the, of the character they were trying to animate because they weren't coming from a foundation of drawing. They didn't understand how to, how to, how to get a nice silhouette, you know, to have a good shape, a very clear uh, pose. Those key frames are very important. They're what tell the story. You learn that by drawing and by observation. The story you're trying to tell in your illustration or in your animation, again, you must learn. It has to feel like something that I would see in real life has to come from observation. So that's something very important. That's something that I'm trying to teach here. I'm trying to, to educate and try to give them that example. But I, it's, it's yet to be seen. We'll see if this, if this works. You know, you ask me in five years, we'll see what happened. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Anything else? Uh, the last one. Uh, what, oh, what advice do you like to give the upcoming artists on how they can create beautiful works. I suppose it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I may have covered yeah, that. Like, yeah. You know, my advice to this school is to build a foundation, you know, myself or find other um, talented artists with experience. You bring these people in and they train the next generation. 
someone like Elmira, who has been through uh, a proper art school foundation, you know, I was one of her teachers, bring those, you train those people and then, you know, if they work in the industry, fine. If they don't, bring them back here and start building a faculty with more skills, okay? And then, of course, as the students come in, it's, it's a mentorship program. That's, that's the way we did it at Disney. You always had to get somebody with experience to bring them in and to train the next generation. And then that would train the next generation. This is going to take time. Luckily, your, uh, your, your, um, your government and, and, and some of the private companies that are uh, investing in the school, this is a great opportunity for the people here. Uh, but also, there's an awareness. Animation is good business. It's making money. It's bringing jobs. It always has. That's why I got into the business. <laughs> I, got a, I got a job, you know, because Disney was hiring and they were doing these incredible things. Uh, if this, if this, this country or this school is, it wants to continue to develop, then they must have foundational drawing. They must learn the foundations of animation. So we're gonna, we have to be looking at a 2D department as well as just the CGI. I see that now that I see a lot of computer stuff. It's all great. But what are you going to do with it? What do you do with the technology? What do you do with the pencil? You know, that comes to the basic core of the artist, the quality of the artist, their ability to draw, understand principles of design, understanding observation of life. So I have to always tell students, let me borrow that for a second. <laughs> you got to have a sketchbook. You better have your sketchbook. You better be out there and develop that habit of looking at life, looking at situations around you, and then drawing them. You'll start making decisions. As an artist, you'll be stronger. That's, that's very important, I have to tell you know, young kids. And nobody wants to draw. It takes too long. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very different. Uh, when I was going through art school, I'll finish with this. When I was going through art school, the industry required you to draw well. Not okay, not so-so. Disney only hired the best illustrators or the best artists. That's what they hired. They had the luxury. But that was a requirement. If you were going to work at a major studio or if you were going to work, you had to be very good at your drawing and understand design and painting and so forth. Today, because of CGI, I think there's a mistake in the minds of the young artists thinking that the technology in some way is going to help you create more beautiful, you mentioned beautiful designs, or more appealing characters, or more appealing stories, or stories that are more endearing. No. No. It never has changed, it never will change. When I was a kid, I was out there playing in the woods, in this, I lived in the country, and we, we were out there having adventures. We were playing in the river, swimming and, and whatever we were doing. And then, then, then the ability to sketch, or to doodle, or to draw, was my ability to take what's in my head and put down on paper. I had no formal training, but later with formal training, now I started learning, oh, there's a process. Oh, there's all these things in design that I, oh, shape them. Well, this shape looks more interesting than that shape. This is something that you can't just learn by looking at a book or a lecture like some of me talking. The artist has to do it. They have to learn by the process of doing it. That's when you develop those skills, those, uh, what's called the, the gut instinct. When a photographer goes out there and they know how to just move in or pull out a little bit, they're very aware of all the space, everything within the frame, the shapes that they're making, the lighting, the tone, the texture. This is something that takes time to develop. As an artist, drawing is one way to do it. Okay? That's the way you start to learn these, sens these sensibilities by that foundation. So that's something I would just, as a process, to, to make an artist, it has to come from the artist. The school will never make an artist. This, it's up to the artist to, to pick up these things, to be inspired, and then to learn from other artists, for example. That's, that's most, most people learn that way. Um, if you want to work in production, you have to work as a team, and then you work as a team to make these productions. So it's different. If you were being an illustrator or a fine artist, you can just be yourself and do one, whatever these amazing things in your little studio. Uh, but it has to be commercial, so it has to get into, a, uh, into um, you know, some kind of studio to be sold. It's very different if you work in animation. Animation still works from um, the core artist, the artist, the basic foundations of those skills that has to be learned, and then it gets applied to the trade, whether it's illustration or animation. When you work in animation, you do work as a team. So 
you have to be a team player. You, know, you have to understand how to work at a team, how to carry your load, and then how to help the next guy. So that's a, it's a very different experience. It's a different process. But anyway, the, the foundations are still there. As an artist, you must have that basic foundation to build from. Okay? Yeah, that's it. Is that good? Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. Me too. Thank you. Okay. Hope uh, the audience can learn.